So one of my most um, vivid childhood memories happened when I was about seven years old. I've actually shared this story here before, but I want to share it again. So I was standing outside of my childhood home in suburban Maryland on Jody Street. Um, outside of our little house. And it wasn't a fancy house, it was very simple, very small. But the thing that I always remember about that house is, is that it had this huge, like beautiful pink magnolia tree and all of these beautiful flowering bushes around the perimeter of the house. And I remember on this particular day, it rained really hard. And I went outside after the rain stopped and suddenly, like everything felt like so fresh and so beautiful, like so vibrant. I remember the colors on that tree and those bushes were so vivid and alive. And I remember this feeling like welling up inside of my little seven-year-old heart, which I didn't have words for at the time, but now as I remember back, I think that feeling was longing. It was a longing that I felt. Like for what, I didn't know. But I knew that it was something that felt bigger than myself, that like I just couldn't name in that moment. Now I had seen this tree so many times before, like on my way back and forth from school when I was playing outside, and I never really thought much about these trees and bushes. But in this moment, it was as if like a veil had been lifted off of the world, you know, or maybe a veil that just was lifted off of my eyes. Like, to use a word that biblical writers love, I didn't just look at them, I beheld them. Like, I beheld their beauty. And it did something to me that even like 45 years later, like, I still remember that moment. So maybe you have an early memory of beauty as a child like that as well, you know, or if you can't think of something from your childhood, you know, maybe there's like something from your recent memory that struck you. You know, maybe it was like a beautiful painting you saw in an art gallery. You know, maybe it was a night full of gorgeous stars that we never see here in New York City. You know, maybe it was hearing a piece of music that really just broke your heart. You know, maybe it was something really mundane, like the, the smell of fresh laundry. Or, something unexpected. Like I have an artist friend um, who was telling me about one day stumbling upon a decaying deer carcass in the woods and finding it beautiful, like so beautiful that she went back to it just week after week and it spoke to her somewhere. I was like, ugh. And she was like, oh, it was, it was so beautiful. It became this meditation on, on death for her. I think that this would actually make a great coffee hour question to ask each other, like, what's your earliest memory of beauty, you know, or your most recent memory of beauty? Like, if you are alive and breathing, like, you have had those moments because the experience of beauty, wonder, awe, is essential to being human. So this summer, we usually do some kind of a series over the summer. So this summer at St. Peter's, we are going to focus on the spiritual practice of beauty. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. One of my favorite quotes from the church father Irenaeus. What that means is that the glory of God is sensual. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, the psalmist says. Now, Cole Arthur Riley says that the Bible talks of knowing God as though it's closer to dinner and a movie than a three-point sermon. If you look at the life of Jesus, he was a very sensual human being. He ate and he drank and he celebrated to the point that the religious leaders of his day called him a drunkard and a glutton. He would touch people. You remember the story of the blind man where Jesus spit into the, the dirt and then he made mud and then he put it on the blind man's eyes. He didn't have to do that. But there was something about the, the touch and the senses and the earth that was so integral to how Jesus interacted and moved in the world. If the glory of God is a human being fully alive, then that means it's emotional. Like it touches on our emotional life. It feels and it lets itself feel rather than just being numb. So Jesus wept. 
Jesus flipped tables over. Jesus knew loneliness and fear and wasn't afraid to express those emotions or open himself up to those emotions because it's all part of being human, made in the image of God. So beauty is a form of resistance to the dehumanizing systems of our world, including religious ones. So unfortunately, throughout its history, the church has often been one of the worst offenders when it comes to dehumanization, and there's many layers to that. But as it relates to what we're talking about this morning, like if something is like sensual or pleasurable, it's like considered a little too titillating. You know, you're opening the door to temptation and the flesh. You know, emotions are seen as being weak. Emotions are untrustworthy guides. They're not legitimate sources of knowledge. The glory of God is a human being fully alive and beauty is essential to being human because beauty is essential to the very nature of who God is. Like it's woven all throughout scripture, like the first chapter of Genesis where God is seen as this artist who's just creating left and right the heavens and the earth and all these flowers and animals and the moon and the stars all the way through to the last chapter of Revelation and that beautiful image of the river of God flowing through the streets of the city, you know, flowering trees and fruit trees on every side, these, this lush picture where the leaves are for the healing of the nations. You know, Psalm 96.9 says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So this summer, I'm inviting us as a church to practice beauty as a form of resistance. So what is this gonna mean? So at its heart, beauty is about paying attention, learning to pay attention versus being distracted or just avoiding. It's about being awake to the world that's around you instead of being asleep or numbing, which is so easy to do. There's this great um, interview that I commend to you on the Ezra Klein show in the New York Times, and he did it with the, the author Marilyn Robinson. Any Marilyn Robinson fans here? All right, oh, a couple, awesome. Yeah, so she wrote a beautiful book called Gilead that won the Pulitzer Prize um, years ago. And he was commenting on her deeply Christian, he called it her deeply Christian relationship to beauty in a good, in a good sense, and this is what she said. She said, beauty is a disciplining consideration for me a mind at peace in any degree, and a mind that's schooled towards good attention. I love that phrase, schooled towards good attention, sees beauty all the time. My tradition would say basically that every experience, every moment is a question being posed to you by God. What do you understand? What do you see? What is wanted out of this moment? It's a great alertness. And the idea that basically it is God who is posing that question very much exalts all kinds of experience. So in, the, in this way, you know, beauty functions very similarly to the prayer of examine. That's something that we really try to kind of get into the life and the, the prayers here at St. Peter's. It's a really important prayer for us, the prayer of examine, which is all about cultivating discernment, of learning how to see and find God in all things so that we might respond to God in all things. So it exercises a very similar kind of muscle of learning to pay attention by beholding what is beautiful and seeing the way that God sees. There's so much we could say about beauty, um, but I'm gonna wrap it up here. So there's just a little, the last thing that I wanna say in this invitation to beauty as a form of resistance and, and why it's so important. And I just want you to bear with me for a moment um, because I wanna read you something that I just could not put any more beautifully than this. So I'm gonna read, read this to you. So this is from Prayer in the Night by Tish Harrison Warren. We read this book a couple years ago during Advent as we were um, practicing Compline, the night prayers of the church. So this book came out during a time of like tremendous grief for Warren. And so she had miscarried twice, you know, in the middle of that, her father died really unexpectedly. So just unimaginable grief. So this is what she says. 
One week after my second miscarriage, I sat in silence, tears streaming down my eyes, watching the ocean and losing count of how many shades of green and blue I saw. Beauty itself was a mother to me, comforting me in her wordless embrace. And here's what struck me in that moment that made my tears run. There was no place she didn't go. There is no space on earth, no sadness too deep that a verdant sprig of glory doesn't somehow crack through the sidewalk. Beauty doesn't take away the pain of suffering or vulnerability, but in the times when we think anguish and dimness are all there is in the world, that nothing is lovely or solid, beauty is a reminder that there is more to our stories than sin, pain, and death. And there's so many painful things happening in our world right now, you know, in our lives. You know, as we speak, my older sister Eunice is in Korea with my parents. You know, as my mother continues to decline, as her mind and body give way to the, the ravages of Parkinson's disease and dementia, one of my very best friends is going through a very public shaming right now that threatens to undo her livelihood and everything that she's worked so hard for her entire life. Bombs continue to fall on Gaza, lives brutally massacred in Darfur. There's a presidential election looming over us this fall that has consequences to impact millions of people's lives around the world. It could be so easy to give way to fear, anxiety, and despair. And so that's why we need beauty now more than ever to remind us that there is more to our stories than sin, pain, and death. You know, I'll share more ways that we're gonna do that as a church a little later. But for now, what I want us to do in this moment is I want to invite you into this breath prayer that's in your bulletins. It's from Cole Arthur Riley's Black Liturgies, which is something that I love. It's just a way of us kind of kicking off the summer and opening up ourselves to God and how God wants to take us deeper into God's beauty in this season. So you can put your bulletin aside if that helps and just be guided by my voice. You can put both feet on the floor and if it helps, you can rest your hands in your lap, palms up or down. If you want to stand up, like if that's easier for you than sitting, you can do that as well. If you're holding a child or trying to keep track of your child, maybe you're lying on the carpet back there, that's beautiful too to be where you are right now and just be present to this moment and just breathe just take three deep breaths just in through the nose and exhale out through the mouth And as we inhale, we're just going to inhale this prayer. God, awaken my soul to beauty. And then just exhale. I resist the tyranny of despair. So inhale. God, awaken my soul to beauty. Exhale. I resist the tyranny of despair. Let's just do that a few times until we can just align it with our breath. Just feel it in our bodies to inhale. 
and exhale. God, awaken our souls to your beauty. We resist the tyranny of despair. And God, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our hope in you. And whether it's something happening on the other side of the world, in the lives of our loved ones, in our very bodies, God, we just want to be alive to you. Let us not grow weary. Let us not give up. Let us not numb ourselves. But God, awaken us to your beauty. Awaken us to you.